Hello everybody and welcome to Pendragon Academy for our paint brushing 101 introductory video. As you can see, I've got a bunch of paint brushes right here. So let's discuss paint brushing and what you want to buy, what they're used for, and how to get everything set up. And then the second episode of this series will discuss actual painting techniques with a paintbrush. So let's go ahead and get started. I've got a wide variety of paintbrushes here. We've got some synthetic Polinsky Sable brushes. We've got a bunch of what I call throwaway brushes. We've got a large round brush. We've got a large flat brush. And we've got a very fine detail brush, which is a little janky, which again, I've used for um, dry brushing. And then I don't think I've got any Series 7 brushes sitting around. Let's see what I've got in here. So I've got a little uh, case for my brushes. Um, I've got a Tamiya brush. These are I've heard are pretty good. I haven't used one of those yet, so this is just sitting there. I've got an AK Interactive Siberian Kalinsky Sable brush, which they're okay. They're not fantastic, so I wouldn't recommend buying those. Um, but let's go ahead and uh, hop over to the PC and let's start going over some brushes. Okay. First and foremost, Windsor & Newton Series 7 Kalinsky Sable Brushes. So, it is widely known within the figure painting community as well as regular model painting community that Kalinsky Sable Brushes are the primary go-to high-quality, high-end, long-lasting paintbrush. Pretty much the best paintbrush that you can buy for um, especially doing detail work. So, when you're painting with acrylics, which is what we mostly paint with. Uh, it's very similar in technique to painting in with water, like watercolor painting. So as you might assume, professional watercolor painting materials are going to be the things that work the best. So this is kind of what most people will start with. The trick to keeping your paintbrushes to last a long time, which is why a lot of people use cheap brushes, is if you get paint inside the ferrule, which is the metal part, that is going to start spreading the hairs of the brush. If you don't clean your brush at the end of every use, that's also going to start spreading the, the hairs of the brush. A Kalinsky Sable brush is made with a Kalinsky, I think it's a weasel or a squirrel. Um, so it's a natural hair brush, which means you cannot use these brushes with solvent based material because think of it just like your regular hair if you put alcohol in your hair then it's going to dry and split and you know crack and do all kinds of stuff so these are specifically used for acrylic painting and i've got synthetic versions of the same thing that i would use for both acrylic and um enamels or lacquers or something like that but these are better than the sable one the synthetic sable in my opinion so you can see they're not horribly cheap, but you don't need a wide variety of sizes. So the sizes go all the way up to a 10, which is massive, but you really just kind of need, I like to keep a number two, number one is gonna be your primary, and number zero is gonna be your second primary. And then if you're doing really fine work, a double zero and a triple zero might be something that you wanna add, that you can see like, they reduce in price. Oh, this one's actually more expensive. That sucks. Um, I mean, I've gotten these for around 10 bucks a piece, but it seems like prices have gone up with inflation. So that's unfortunate, but you can keep an eye out for sales and stuff like that. So yeah, I mean, again, they're not very cheap, but if you want something that's really going to give you fine detail work, that's what you want. So if you're doing figures, this, these are the types of brushes that you want. The next level would be getting the Escoda Prado synthetic sable brush which is ranked as one of the best sa uh, synthetic sables and let's see a number one in that is only 12.99 a number zero 11.99 so these are much less expensive so if you're just getting started you can do both acrylic and oils with these and i just started using them and i like them um they maintain a tip decently well but you have to take care of them a little bit more than you would the synthetics are the the real sable just because synthetic doesn't react the exact same way as natural hair. So it's it's a little bit harder to keep 
perfect, but they do paint very well. Next, for almost all purposes in airbrushing and regular paintbrushing, you need throwaway brushes. So this is what you would use to mix your paints because you don't want to mix your paints with your real brushes because then you get paint in the ferrule. This is what you'll use to mix paint inside your airbrush. Um, you'll use this for doing epoxy if you're going to be doing gluing. Um, I use these for just about anything. So really, you just want to search for the absolute best deal. So um, I'm going to start buying these because they have a longer hair area for mixing paint inside the airbrush. But I also love getting these packs right here of the flat because they're very useful for doing epoxy and stuff like that. So it's important to have throwaway brushes. So you're just looking for the best deal. How much, how many brushes can I get for the least amount of money? Doesn't matter the quality, but that's very important to have on hand. Next, if you have a Hobby Lobby Michaels arts and craft store type thing, then I usually would go there and grab just a set of rounds. Um, just regular old artist rounds. So this is what you could use for dry brushing. Um, I consider them throwaway brushes, but you, you would use them for, for more than just painting once and throwing away. But these are ones that you don't really have to care about, though you'll save money if you treat them correctly. And then I also do a set of flats. These are very important for dry brushing. You can actually trim the length of the brush themselves and make them stiffer or uh, more or less stiff, depending upon the length. And that's what you would use for dry brushing techniques. And then finally, a wet palette is very important when you're doing regular painting work. So you could put paint inside little plastic containers or on the backs of lids or things like that. But if you want to keep the paint to last long enough and do kind of like its own little self mixing, then a wet palette keeps the paint fresh for multiple days at a time and also helps to thin the paint so that you can do nice thin layers. So all it is is a permeable waxy paper substance with a piece of foam below and you fill the container up with water up to the level of the foam and then depending upon the type of paper you have to make the paint perme or the, the paper permeable so usually people will soak this on a plate put it in the uh, microwave and heat it up a little bit and that allows for the the surface to become permeable otherwise you can just put this underneath a piece of foam for a few hours then when you bring it back out it has soaked in enough material to where it's going to be permeable um but then you've got a lid for it you know so you start you put your paints on here you mix your paints just like a regular palette and they will stay wet for days and days and days it's really really cool so i've tried this one it works okay um the one that i'm using currently is this guy just because it's got a bunch of different material. Um, I like having the gray foam underneath. So I've got a wet palette right here. And this one I've been using when I was painting some Red Riding Hood stuff. See that it's still actually wet in here, though most of the paint on this has dried because I haven't used this in a couple of weeks, but the areas where the paint is thick, <laughs> it's crazy that it's actually still completely usable. But then underneath, you've got your piece of foam and some water, and you can wash the foam out. But I like this one because you can do multiple things with it. Because if you remove the bottom, then you've actually got some surface underneath here if you wanted to flip it over. Though I guess I wouldn't flip it over if you've got paint in there. Um, but you have also have this entire surface that you can use. And it's pretty compact. So I like this one, even though it's $35. It's worth it to me. But... Your mileage may vary. If you want to get started and just test one out, the Stay Wet palette is pretty cheap at $13.96. You can always get plenty of different sheets of material to replace the stuff with. I mean, it's all basically the same stuff. People make their own, but I've never been able to make my own where the material is actually permeable. And I think that's the biggest issue. Um, so, so yeah. So if you were to get started and you were brand new to this, I would get a Stay Wet palette at $13.96. Then I would go to your craft store or Amazon, grab a set of flats, grab a set of rounds, and then grab some bulk paint brushes, and then probably just start with these. And then maybe if you wanted to try this out, just get one of the Windsor & Newton. Again, the number one is going to be the most useful. So that's kind of how I would start. Um, if you want to go ahead and do that, then it'll make much more sense for some of the future videos. Otherwise, if you can't afford it, 
just get what you can because it's all about getting started. It's not about saying, okay, I don't have enough money to be able to get all of the expensive stuff or the best quality material, but just start with what you can afford. You know, uh, it's better to begin enjoying the hobby and doing stuff than it is to just sit here and wait and say, you know, when do I have money for this? So if you can only afford cheap paintbrushes, start with the cheap paintbrushes. Then whatever they run out, you can buy some more, you know? Um, you're not stuck with these recommendations. These are just some of the best recommendations over my years of experience to say, you know, what I know works well and what doesn't. But again, if you buy the expensive ones, then you've got to be able to keep them clean. So that's another thing to pay attention to. And that just means, for the most part, you can get a brush conditioner, which is nice, it's just like a kind of a, kind of like a soap. And you can soap them up and clean them up. But really it's like when you're done using it, get it clean with water and then just try not to get paint into the ferrule. And that's going to keep that brush nice and sharp, which will allow you to do all of that fine detail. It's really important. But that's our introduction to paint brushes. Um, in the next video, we will go over some basic painting techniques and just go over what each type of brush might be used for. We'll grab a sample little model and test them out and all that kind of stuff and show you some paint brush stroking techniques and all that kind of stuff so you can see what a glaze looks like and a wash and doing a base color. Um, and we'll start, once we do an introduction to airbrushing and an introduction to paintbrushing as far as the actual physical techniques, then we will combine those two series to start working on some projects or some specific just techniques and say, okay, I want to do this. I want to do rust or streaks or some kind of dust weathering effect or base coloring and whatever, whatever. And we'll say, okay, you know, you're going to combine paintbrushing and airbrushing a lot between models and figures. It's all, they're all, they'll use multiple techniques, even though you could use an airbrush to paint most of an object, or you could use a paintbrush to paint most of an object. Each one has its specific use case where it will allow that model to shine. If that makes sense. Like for example, on this gal right here, this Red Riding Hood uh, sculpture, this uses a wide variety of techniques. We're using airbrushing for some base coats. Uh, for the fur, that was completely done by hand. The jacket was a mixture of both airbrushing and paintbrushing. The face was a mixture of airbrushing and paintbrushing. The hair was all hand painted. Um, a lot of the details were hand painted. The rock surface underneath this area here was all hand brush or hand painted. So, I mean, there's a wide changes in techniques depending upon what you're actually doing. So you just do whatever works best for that. And I think that's part of the process of why a channel like this is important for Patreon is so that you can see what these recipes are in the certain use cases and you can start getting familiar with them. So that when you say, oh, I want to do this on this model, you can look, think back and be like, oh, okay, I know I know a technique that's going to work for that because I've seen it done before. You know, a lot of the time people get caught up and nervous about something because you just don't know what the different recipes are. You know, you need to see it done. You need to understand, you know, why somebody would do something like that and then be able to use that on your own projects. So that's a lot of what we're going to be doing here with the technique videos and then also the project videos themselves, which are both inf informative and entertaining. You know, you get to see a lot of wide variety of models get made and how these techniques get used in the real world, basically. So anyway, so that's that. Um, check in for the next episode and don't forget to watch the airbrushing video if you haven't watched the airbrushing video and don't forget to watch the 3D printing introductory video if you're interested in 3D printing we'll go over how to set up a 3D printer and just the very basics for turning it on and leveling it and stuff like that and that series will continue so that there, there will be a steady stream of airbrushing video or uh, 3D printing videos that come out alongside all the painting and building videos we want to make sure we cover the bases for what is used in the hobby now so that's it. Thank you guys very much. Again, this is Ethan with Pendragon Academy, and we'll see you next time. Bye.